Hello hackers, welcome to a new module in Pwn College. I'm very excited to talk to you today about dynamic allocator misuse with the introductory lecture about what the heap is. You uh, probably heard me use the term heap um, just kind of casually throughout the course. Um, we're gonna dive into the very crux of it. So let's start from uh, kind of something close to first principles. First principles, um, consider the types of memory. Um, the types of memory that we've covered so far is uh, kind of a, uh, varies, right? We've talked about different um, parts of an ELF file, um, especially as it's loaded into memory. Uh, the text section, the PLT, the GOT, um, the BSS, where we uh, interacted with global variables uh, and so on. Um, We've talked about the stack pretty extensively as uh, you have um, used return-oriented programming um, by programming return uh, addresses onto the stack to accomplish your goals um, and so on. Um, but what we haven't really covered yet is a use case that is a fairly common use case, very common use case for um, programs, um, which is a place to store memory that is dynamically allocated, but also long lived, right? So the stack kind of allocates memory um, during uh, the invocation of a function, right? Or uh, alloc memory is allocated on the stack, space is reserved on the stack when a function is invoked, but when the function returns, that memory is deallocated. Um, but what if you had, for example, a uh, state of a game that had a list of um, entities like bad guys or something um, that you had to track and this list might grow, might shrink, uh, there might be uh, some baddies sp that spawn, might be some baddies that get destroyed um, and uh, all of this needs to survive across invocations of many different functions. Well, we can think back to the type of memory that we've interacted with and um, there's an additional one um, that I didn't mention previously, which is a uh, memory mapped memory, right? So we have uh, seen the use of MMAP to create pages in memory on demand um, and uh, interact with them, right? And so of course you can say, okay, then no problem. For every baddie, uh, for every NPC, for every uh, entity or every object that we need to persist across multiple invocations of multiple functions, we will use MMAP to create a, um, a page of memory, to map a page of memory, and then use that page of memory. And when we're done, we'll uh, unmap it. Um, so this is great in that it allows uh, this dynamic allocation, deallocation, and it, um, uh, uh, the end allocated memory survives across different functions. That's awesome, right? However, it has problems, uh, a couple of problems. One is um, the allocation size is very inflexible. It has to be a multiple of 4096 bytes. So that's uh, because that's how, how big a page is. And MemMap all, all only um, works on um, the basis of a page, right? The other problem is that it, this is a very, very slow solution. Memory map, um, memory mapping, the creation on mapping, the changing of memory maps, it all has to go through the kernel um, and, it has, and, and that's slow. Right, you have to switch into kernel space. You have to uh, the syscall has to be handled, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's a, quite a lot of overhead associated with that. So we could uh, get a little bit more clever, and we say, okay, but we don't need to memory map for every single uh, element of, of of an array if that element or of a of a data structure or whatever, if that element is um, small. Right, if it's uh, 16 bytes, we don't have to allocate an entire page of 4096 bytes. We'll just allocate that page, and then we'll slowly start handing off pieces, right? So we could write a library that, that does this, that has an allocate memory uh, function that, you know, we say, give me 128 bytes, and it gives you a pointer to the beginning of that page. Then and, and keeps track of that, that 128 has been used, and you say, okay, give me another 256 bytes. And then it'll uh, give you, uh, you know, the 256 bytes, and then maybe you can have some um, uh, function for saying, okay, I no longer need this memory. 
And what this is, is a dynamic allocator. And these exist. This is in fact how memory is managed. Um, we're not the first to have this idea, shockingly, right? Um, pictured here is Doug Lee. He uh, released, created and released the first um, kind of very public, very um, accessible allocator into the public domain. So this was very cool. It's kind of uh, not just open source, but it, you just dumped it on the internet and said, do with this what you will um, in 1987, right? So this idea is very much not new. It was over, in fact, over 30 years old. Um, Doug Lee created DL Malik. DL is Doug Lee, um, which has morphed into or or was forked and and expanded. DL Malik, by the way, still exists. You can go to Doug Lee's uh, website. He's a uh, uh, computer science professor in New York now, um, and I think was back then. Uh, this photo is again, I think, uh, already quite dated. I tried to find a, a photo um, back from something that looked like 1987. Um, Later on, DL Malik was forked uh, into um, the Linux user space, or really into uh, glibc um, as PT Malik. PT stands for Pulsex Thread Aware. So it's a, a multi-threaded implementation of uh, DL Malik. Um, and there are other uh, Maliks in other parts of the computing world. Uh, FreeBSD uh, had something called JE Malik. Um, it's also used in, in Firefox, Android, a couple of other applications. Um, Windows has uh, several different heap implementations as well. And then um, there's a bunch of custom ones in kernel and so forth. There's uh, quite a lot of um, different implementations of this um, all over the place. But in this course, we focus on Linux and we're going to focus on PT Malik specifically, but a lot of the concepts that we discuss will be applicable across across other dynamic allocators. All right, I keep saying the heap. Where the heck did this uh, word come from? Uh, it's actually unclear. I, I tried to track down a historic usage of the heap. Um, it is not called the heap because of the um, similarly named uh, data structure. Right. The heap is an actual, a heap is an actual data structure in computer science. That's not what we're talking about. Um, what we're talking about is more uh, of usage in the sense of a heap of stuff, like a, like a pile, the heap. Um, for whatever reason, the uh, memory space that's managed by the dynamic allocator is colloquially known as the heap. Um, and I think from here on in this module, I'll rarely say dynamic allocator, I'll probably say heap. All right, so what does the heap do? Um, as implemented by really DL Malik and then now PT Malik and, and all of its analogs, um, the heap provides, and actually, if we wanted to go into kind of the, the ancient history of Malik, uh, the first uh, book on C, the C programming language, let's pull it up. the C programming language um, actually included a 200 line version of Malik. This was the um, book created, written by the creators of um, C. It's known as the KNR book. Um, you should consider uh, checking it out. Um, there's a Wikipedia article, it's that important. Um, and it was published in 1978, uh, and then nine years later, DL Malik came onto the scene, I think with a very similar uh, interface. Um, oops, all right. So the interface to uh, allocators is Malik free, right? You use Malik to get a chunk of memory to use. You use free to give it back. Um, there are also some auxiliary functions, realloc, you, you um, say, hey, I had this previous allocation. Can you please uh, make it bigger? Um, C alloc is a, is a helper function that will allocate and zero out the memory, right? So as we talked about in memory errors, um, uh, uninitialized data can lead to data disclosure and so forth. 
see how it helps guard against that. There are a couple of uh, other ones, um, depending on what you're using. For example, uh, PT Malik has something called Realic Array, which is a fancier version of Realic. But, but for the most part, the relevant things are, are Malik and Free here, and then the others, of course, also come into play. Um, and basically, every single program that is not Hello World, and even, in many cases, Hello World, uses the heap. This is one of the most important uh, parts of the building blocks of software. Uh, C++ programs behind the scenes use this functionality. Uh, scanf and printf behind the scenes use this functionality and likely any moderately complex program uses this functionality. All right, how does the heap work? Um, this is a good question. Uh, our, our hypothetical um, dynamic calculator implementation from um, the beginning of this lecture worked by uh, memory mapping something and then splitting off chunks of it. Interestingly, PT malloc does not use mmap. Um, it uses what is called the data segment. Data segment is a historical oddity. Back from the, the old, old, old times, um, pre-AMD64, uh, pre-modern usage of x86, even when memory space was heavily segmented um, and you had a segment just for data. Um, nowadays, this has been kind of co-opted into this, uh, the, the heap. Um, with modern uh, memory placement techniques, specifically with address space layout randomization, the data segment is placed randomly somewhere near, but not actually right up against and not, um, you know, a constant offset off of. It's just somewhere near the, the base of a position independent uh, binary. Um, it starts out with a size of zero, so it doesn't actually show up on uh, your process's memory map. And it's managed by two system calls. One system call is sbreak, um, which returns, um, it, when, when you pass null to it, it returns the current end of the data segment. Um, if you pass a number to it, it, it shifts the data segment by that many bytes. And another one is break, which is um, if you pass in an address, it'll expand the end of the data segment to that address or probably shrink it um, as well. Under the hood, so these are memory calls into the kernel, or memory calls, system calls into the kernel. Under the hood, of course, this all works just like MMAP. Uh, the kernel maps memory, puts it in places, and so forth. Uh, it's not exactly clear why the heap of mutations don't just use um, MMAP, at least it's not exactly clear to me um, from a security perspective. And obviously it's not so relevant um, but uh, it's just an interesting oddity that, that there's yet another way to manage memory. Um, let's take a quick look at um, what, uh, at the data segment, how it works uh, from user space. Uh, let's just create a new function, a new, a new program. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is uh, malloc 16. That's it, just malloc 16 bytes. Um, if we compile this, all right, run it. Obviously, it does nothing, but let's S trace it. Here's what happens. All right, if we look. Um, through what it uh, the system calls it makes here. Actually, let's do this. Let's about to malloc. We want to say that we're about to malloc, and then we'll we'll be able to see when the data segment gets called or uh, gets set up. All right, so. Hmm. Sorry, I should have gotten this. Should have set this up earlier. Uh, I decided to go off script. That is never a good idea. All right, here we say about to malloc. Let's just write uh, to standard out the message with the length of the message. 
Uh, the reason I'm removing puts is it's possible that puts uses malloc internally. I want to catch the first use of malloc so that you can see the data segment being set up. All right, here we go. We say, and that's what was happening in fact. So uh, we wrote about to malloc. All right, that's great. Here's the output of that. And then it mallocs. And the first time the heap is used in libc, um, the uh, data segment is set up. Um, so here we have, it first calls sbreak. I'm not sure why strace uh, screws this up. Um, it could be something crazy under the hood. That's uh, very possible. It could be that now that I think about it, maybe sbreak is a library wrapper and not a system call. Um, both of these uh, system calls are not part of the kind of Unix standard that, that Linux tries to follow called POSIX. Um, they, they used to be, but then they were taken out. So things can vary. So it's very possible that, that actually these are the same um, system call. Anyways, when passed in with null, um, it returns the address of the current and address of the data segment. And as I said, it starts out um, uh, zero size. And then it says, okay, well, let's, let's, um, allocate some, uh, part, some amount of space in the data segment. And it calls it with some increased value. Um, and we can actually jump into IPython and print out what this actually, that's going to be the lower value. The data segment, unlike the stack grows normally to the right. Um, the new address minus the old address. This is exactly how much it allocates. Uh, hex uh, 21000. That is 21 pages of memory that it just allocates uh, the first time you use the stack uh, or the heap, sorry. Um, we can actually, if we can see, nah, slash flag. Uh, if you look at proc self maps, Um, so this will read out the mapping before and after the allocation. Let's trace it again. So here, this is before the allocation. Uh, you can see there is no um, nothing between the data segment and libc. There, there's no heap yet. Then this occurs, these two break calls, and now we have the heap. All right, and that heap is exactly uh, from the first address that was returned by break, 84200 to this 86300 right here. All right, so that is the heap. Now, what if um, we try to allocate more than uh, um, is available on the in the data segment? So let's say there is what there's. 2000 or 2100, what if we allocate 3000? Um, and yeah, so if we let's PCC it, S trace. So here, this is where we're allocating our large amount of memory, and we can see that the um, heap is actually being expanded to fit. Um, all that allocation. So basically, PT malloc is a um, neat library. Uh, it's 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 open source. You can uh, obviously you can go look it up and read it. It's something like three or five thousand lines of code, um, and it uh, is what does allocation for you. By the way, if you try to allocate gigantic things rather than using data segments and so forth, it'll just use uh, mmap, which is uh, pretty neat. All right. So, um, what are uh, the dangers of the heap? It's a good question. Sorry, technical glitch. Um, what are the dangers of the heap? Um, the problem is, of course, the heap is used by imperfect human programmers, right? The, the number one cause of security issues are humans. Um, humans will forget to free memory. Humans will forget um, where they've stored pointers to memory they've allocated. Humans will forget what they freed, right? When they do remember to free memory. Um, and coupled that, that coupled with the fact that the um, 
heap allocators strive for performance almost above all else. They need to be fast, right? Because it's un uh, the, the, the programs that use them could be performance critical. For example, uh, you could have a video game that uses uh, dynamic allocators a lot and that video game needs to run fast. And so your dynamic allocator needs to be fast. Um, so the, the, the problem is that uh, with a massive focus on optimization, security is often left behind. Um, and this leads to uh, issues caused by number one becoming security issues when combined with number two. All right. Um, how do we detect problems, uh, bugs that we make with the heap before they become issues? Uh, there are a couple of ways. One is there's a memory um, analysis, uh, execution analysis tool called Valgrind. Um, if you have test cases that trigger some problem, for example, a very common problem is you forget to free memory, so you run out of resources. If you have uh, test cases that trigger that, Valgrind can often, um, w when you execute those test cases through Valgrind, it can find the error. Um, GLibc itself has some hardening techniques. There are uh, uh, global variables you can set to make the heap uh, a little more defensive oriented. Um, a lot of these will tank performance, ex especially this one. This one makes all um, um, allocations be, be done through MMAP, but um, some of these are, are um, and, and a lot of these can still be bypassed. There's no silver bullet. Um, and then there are a lot of uh, kind of more secure allocators that have been developed. Um, but in general, uh, they haven't really been deployed. They're usually much slower than, um, the allocators that we know and love. Um, and in general, no, no generic technique has been created for detecting these sorts of errors. And this is a similar theme to, um, detecting other types of errors. Um, so, so problems are pretty serious. In this module, we'll go through a lot of these problems, uh, starting with a slightly deeper dive into the types of dangers and then going into actual implementation uh, specifics. I hope you will have fun with this one.